Hello, Tutu Group. Here we are on my patio outside. I'm outside for a couple reasons. One, just to try and enjoy nature a little bit, being stuck inside. But number two, more importantly, is I had to work on my uh, yard trimmer um, and fix a couple things. Anyway, um, what I'm going to deliver to you today is the bomb. And uh, so here we go. Uh, and there's really a couple questions that have to be answered. Number one and most important question was, did the U.S. have to drop the bomb? Now, there's four viewpoints. And I know some of you have already answered this, meaning some of you already have this preconceived thought. However, you need to look at some things. First point of view that historians have argued is the orthodox view. The orthodox view is the one that was held by the president and his advisors. The orthodox view is very simple. It says the bomb was dropped to shorten the war save lives. Now, when we last left off, if you're sitting on the beaches of Okinawa and you're looking at Japan and you're thinking about invading it, you're okay with this decision. As I told you about Paul Fussell, F-U-S-S-E-L-L, okay? That's the orthodox view. If you want to look this up, you need to look up a guy named James Burns. That's spelled B-Y-R-N-E-S. He was the Secretary of State in 1945. James Burns committed to his own diary and writings that it was a necessity to drop this to save lives and shorten the war. Now, that's his perspective, remember. It doesn't mean it's true. The other man, the second man for the Orthodox view, was the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. But in his writings, he basically said it was the lesser of two evils. And what did he mean by that? Remember, prior to this, the Americans had been launching an incendiary bombing campaign and hitting the Japanese. Therefore, his view is the starvation and the isolation and the constant bombardment of Japan was just as cruel and inhumane. The dropping of the bomb then brought a close to the war. Okay, so that's the orthodox view. The second view is called the realist view. Now, the realist view was held by a very strange and odd group of people at this time. It was the U.S. War Department Bombing Strategic Service. Yes, they did an analysis on this. They actually wrote some stuff and actually did some intel. And they argued that Japan's surrender was imminent. They gave a date of possibly by, nine, by November of 1945 that the Japanese would surrender. Now, why? That's an interesting one is the second one, the realist view. Here's what you have to know if you research it. This U.S. War Department came to this conclusion for a couple things. One, they understood that Japan as an island could not be sufficiently fed and sufficiently supported by themselves. Therefore, there was a need to hurry along this idea of ending the war. Plus, remember this other thing. Japan was given the unconditional surrender ultimatum. This now puts you into a difficult situation. And I'll get back to that later, that there's going to be this idea of conditional surrender finally put in place. Ooh, kind of a guilt-ridden thing. And one of the great historians who happened to be a reporter at several of the battles, including Okinawa, was a man I already mentioned previously, okay? And I'll get back to him in a minute, named Hanson Baldwin. He wrote a book at the end of it called The Great Mistakes of the War. And Baldwin had some really good insight into this, that the Americans said unconditional surrender, and the issue was the emperor, and then said, well, wait a minute, we'll do conditional surrender after we drop the first bomb. <laughs> okay, the Japanese, this is probably perplexing to them. But the fact is that there was negotiations going on. They just needed to go faster because why not wait till November 1945? That would be the ultimate question. We'll come back to the realist view because we got to look at the third view, which is really the key to this realist view. It's called the revisionist view. Now, the revisionist view is very simple. The Soviet Union was the real issue. Drop the bomb. The only thing, only thing you got to think about is this. Who had the bomb? The U.S. had the bomb. We had a monopoly on this. And so by dropping the bomb, it's really a signal to those sole Soviets. Two things. One, not wanting the Soviets to come into the war in Asia because the fear of then they take property and territory and we have to negotiate this. Plus, to put a pause on them, giving them a stern warning with anything dealing with Eastern Europe. We've got the bomb. Don't forget it. And so this is the real thing that you have to center on is the revisionist and the realist kind of almost seemingly pulling together if you think about it long enough. Why not wait to November 1945? If the War Department said, look, it's imminent, they're going to surrender. There's no reason to do anything else. The reality was this revisionist. And the guy to look up is a historian who's very bright about this. In fact, there's two guys I'll give you. The first guy 
is William Appleman Williams. That's a fun name. And William, <laughs> William Appleman Williams, a brilliant historian, in 1972 wrote and said his thesis was the U.S. dropped the bomb to shorten the war, but thereby, is the key word he used, to put the Soviets on alert. Don't forget who's really in charge here. Think on this. For 500 years, this is 1945, right? For 500 years, who had been the center of power in the world? Look at the globe. Europe. This is now, you have two left standing. There's a vacuum of power, a power vacuum. And so the U.S. and the Soviets, and it's just a clear signal the U.S. is going to take a position as leader of the free world. The last one, the fourth uh, view, okay, uh, was held by uh, a couple people. It was called the moralist view. It's inhumane. Okay, you drop this horrible, horrible bomb with radiation, uh, and it would last forever. Okay, and, and the devastation uh, for generations to come. And the moralist view has always been one that has been written about quite a bit. Looking back on it specifically, um, but let's go back to the other point I was making earlier about the revisionist. There was one other person during the period of time that wrote quite a bit about this, and he wrote a book in 1948. He made this commentary, but then wrote a book a little bit later on. And this was a British scientist, and I like the idea a scientist wrote this. Um, his name's Harry Blackett, B-L-A-C-K-E-T-T, -T. and Blackett simply said, that's the reason the bomb was dropped. It had to do, and he had a wonderful way to put it. He said, not only was it the last act of the World War II, it was the first act of the Cold War, and I love that. That was a really interesting phrase to use. So when you look at this, did the U.S. need to drop the bomb? Is an interesting question. Why did they? The better question is, why did they drop a second one? See, because we get to the first one with Hiroshima, we can pull all this in together about the realists and the revisionists and the orthodox and say, okay, shorten the war. Check. Okay. The idea of putting the Soviets on pause, last act, first act. Check. Got it. But then you have to come back to one other thing. Why? Why the second bomb? And that is really the best thing, because as you had the first one on Hiroshima drop, the negotiations were in in place. OK, the Japanese were saying, look, we're getting this done. We're getting this done. But it does go back to the problem with him. And this became one of the key elements of this. OK, these actual conditions of the surrender and what uh, 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 Hanson Baldwin pointed out very eloquently is that this is where the Americans became rather duplicitous. They argued unconditional. Now they went to the idea of conditional. And now you have the problem of, okay, how did the Japanese respond to this? It's an interesting act, this dropping of the bomb. But let's get to really one other point. What was the result? Okay, we can argue, should we have done it? Should we not have done it? The bottom line is it was happening. Um, and it did drop. Um, one of the biggest things, one of the most important things as a result, it did lead to, as several other people warned, a proliferation. A larger amount of people got this bomb. Soviets got it very quickly. In other words, the arms race. Once you get to, to the idea of the dropping of the bomb, the one thing you have to get to right away is it created this massive arms race. And here we are today. And I'll give you one other gentleman to look up. His name is Steve Scheinkin, uh, S-H-E-I-N-K-I-N. And Scheinkin wrote this wonderful little piece, this beautiful piece about the bomb, looking at it in retrospect and doing all his research, dealing with science. And he pointed out one very important thing. If India and Pakistan had a nuclear exchange, which they're both nuclear, by the way, isn't that fun? If they simply dropped some of their bombs, which would be less than 1% of the total atomic weaponry in the world, it would absolutely devastate life on Earth. Because the scientists went back and said simply, it would blot out the sun for almost 10 years. Now, if you know anything about world history, you got to have farming. And this would be absolutely devastating if it blocked out the sun, if you can imagine. So it is really the sense of nuclear deterrence. It has brought us to the sense that you have to be very careful in negotiations. You have to be very sincere in how you approach this. Diplomacy must reign. Man, for the first time in history, has the capability to do something, wipe out the planet. Um, and speaking of that, think of today. Think of this one little virus. Think of how it's expanded. Think of the impact and the chain effect. It's a stern warning. And all throughout the Cold War, the thing the Soviets and the Americans eventually come to, JFK and Khrushchev, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev, is how do you get a lock on this? Good luck, because it's out there. And this has forever changed our lives, just as our lives are changed right now. 
So think on this a little bit. I'm not presenting this in a sense that you have to know, you know, your decision. This is not a personal decision like we go to the voting poll. But what I'm pointing out is you have to do some research. You have to be very careful before you come to this idea of an opinion versus this concept of develop, developing a thesis. It's a very distinctive act. We've talked about a lot of this in history. Also remember, I told you about the three general propositions of war. What's the first general proposition, if you remember? Diplomacy, yes. Diplomacy fails. What do we do? We meet our objectives through military means. In other words, when you look at the bomb, the one thing is, was this a political or a military act? Hmm. I'll let you think on that with the revisionist school. Okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Don't forget to do your quizzes. Okay? And don't forget to come to the tutoring session so we can have a wonderful dialogue. I've been really missing you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.